I think that where the work remains for me and for others is how do we continue to foster conversations that invite people into this knowing and this awareness with themselves that gives them room to let God be who God is, right? That like you get to you get to lean into the truth of your experience and it be holy. You get to lean into the truth of I I I I, I deal with anxiety, right? You know, you get to live you live, get to live in the truth of the of the reality that I may, you know, live with and manage a depressive condition. And yet I'm still good, right? That like that, you know, I may have a personality disorder and yet I'm still good, right? And so what does it mean for us to honor that we live in a world where people need us to be that where people need, I'll put it this way, where people need us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that way. Now I am not sure what I believe. Do you believe in hope? Cause I am hopeless. Do you Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and this is like the 45th time I've recorded this intro. Uh, Sometimes you have some technical difficulties, and my laptop has been doing some very strange things. Uh, It made my voice sound like an alien, so not sure what was going on there, but I think we have it fixed. So anyway, welcome back. Uh, This week, really exciting guest. Uh, I had a really good time with her, Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second, but... In the meanwhile, if you are new to the podcast, thank you so much uh, for joining and for for finding us. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, uh, if you want to check out all things uh, Deconstructionist Podcast, go to www.thedeconstructionist.com. Uh, there is kind of our main hub where you can find everything. So you know, links to social media, uh, blog posts, uh, our entire back catalog of episodes that you can stream directly from the site for free. Uh, additionally, we have our web store on there. So if you're interested in picking up a coffee mug or a pint glass or a t-shirt or whatever, uh, we've got stuff like that on there. And then also links to our Patreon campaign. If you would like to financially support the podcast and, uh, all the costs associated with it, theme music, uh, as always provided by Forrest Clay, our good friend Clay, uh, put out an EP not too long ago called the recovery EP. It's found anywhere you find your music. It's a really great EP. It's beautiful, uh, heartbreaking in parts. Um, we actually have an episode coming out specifically about it. Had a lot of people asking about the the theme music and specifically the songs and where to find them. You can find them on all the streaming services, but also, uh, obviously, you can purchase them through uh, iTunes. Um, but yeah, beautiful EP. Uh, it's all about deconstruction and kind of some critiques of, uh, of the church, if you will. Um, but Absolutely fantastic. Uh, again, it's Forrest Clay. Go check it out. The guest this week is uh, Candace Marie Bembo. Uh, she's fantastic. Uh, really enjoyed uh, her personality. She's just one of those types of people who's just uh, super, super outgoing and bubbly and, um, and uh, just really fun to talk to. She is a multi-genre theologian who situates her work at the intersections of beauty, faith, feminism, and culture giving voice to black women's shared experiences of healing and journeying toward wholeness, reimagining how faith can be a tool of liberation and transformation for women and girls. She challenges black women to think critically about how they see God and the world. She's been named by sojourners as one of the 10 Christian women shaping the church in 2020. Candace has written for various outlets, including essence magazine, glamour magazine, the root vice, Shondaland, Madame Noir, and the Me Too movement. Her first book just came out. It's called Red Lip Theology for Church Girls Who've Considered Tithing to the Beauty Supply Store When Sunday Morning Isn't Enough. We talk all about it. It's a fantastic book. Uh, Very, very creative endeavor. Uh, Hope you like it. 
And uh, I'll stop blabbing. We'll get to it. Uh, without further ado, I give you Candace Marie Benbow. What matters most As the lights go out and I swim towards the coast Love of life All right. Candace Marie Benbow, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, you've got a new book out called Red Lip Theology. And obviously, I got to ask you what Red Lip Theology entails, what it means. But before we get into that, though, uh, tell the listeners a little bit about your background, um, what you do currently, and and, and maybe, uh, you know, if you grew up uh, particularly religious or what your kind of um, faith upbringing was. Yeah, so I um, am a writer and theologian. By day, you can find me at the Grio, where I'm the daily lifestyle writer there. Um, but I am, I was born and raised in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in a missionary in the Missionary Baptist Church tradition, um, and really grew up a church girl. Was there on Wednesdays for Sunday school. I mean, not on Wednesdays for Sunday school, but Wednesdays for Bible study. Um, on was there on Saturday for whether it was youth choir rehearsal or you youth usher rehearsal or my mama's choir rehearsal. Um, <laughs> and was there on Sunday for Sunday school for. 11 o'clock morning worship, and if there was a service to come back to, was back there for that. So I have, um, the church was where I found my voice and my place, and it was and is um, one of the most formational institutions of my life. Yeah, it's it's amazing, too, like regardless of our kind of a uh, background, like what we grew up in the faith tradition or the interpretation, you know, faith, um, I guess, interpretation that we grew up in despite that. And maybe some of the things that we no longer maybe necessarily agree with that we kind of found ourselves back here anyway. Right. Like it's right. kind of interesting. It came full circle. Yeah. Like, I mean, so my, my mother, um, would have said, well, it is the, it is the definition of train up a child in the way that, <laughs> you know, she would love that. Um, yeah. but I think, so I think it's part that, um, but I think that we, I think that there's something beautiful about a journey where you, um, have found what it means to, um, to to discover the holy and to um, lean into it as much as um, as is possible and to discover what a true and lasting relationship with God and the divine can look like. And I think that I think that so many of us are on that journey and have appreciated that we don't have to let go of God in order for that to be true for us, um, doesn't necessarily mean that our, that it looks like what it used to look like. Um, doesn't even mean that it won't continue to evolve, but I do think that we learned that we don't have to live our lives without God. And I think and without the church. And I think what so what has pained so many of us as we move through these kind of conversations is that, or so many people, is that we believe that we had to. We believe that we had to abandon church and faith in order to um in order to have these kind of deep wells of spirituality. But we, but we're finding the beauty is that we don't have to. We don't have to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's we've been kind of offered up this this false notion of this all or nothing kind of proposition. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like that. And I really like what you said about um, uh, relationships and evolution. And like in any other relationship you have in your life, uh, it evolves and it grows yes. and it becomes. Uh, something even more beautiful and deeper, uh, at yes. least you hope, right? Like 
if yeah. you're in a relationship with somebody, you hope that it grows and becomes deeper. And why would that not be the same with God? Yeah, I think, I think, and so this is where um, those of us who, who are theologically trained would say, this is where process theology and the process God comes in, right? That God um, is, that God moves and is moved by, right? That like, Mm. that when you get to, when you get to a place where you understand that quite possibly the two most significant relationships in your life um, will be the relationship that you have with yourself. And if you are a Christian, um, the relationship that you have, or uh, if you are a Christian and, or, um, a believer in God, uh, the relationship that you have with God and the divine, right. That those will be the two most important and significant relationships that you have because they then ground all of the other relationships that you have. Right. And so, if it's a relationship, then it's a relationship, right? That like there's, there's spaces in which, you know, um, and I talk about it in the book, like this, the, there were, there was a season of great pain and difficulty. It was hard. And, um, I felt like God had abandoned me. I felt like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the very worst thing that could have happened to me was my mother dying um, unexpectedly. And as, as in any relationship, um, there was some ways that God had to earn my trust back, you know? Um, but because God valued and values our relationship, um, I can look at points where there were specific prayers that I prayed that were answered, right? That like, and, and too often, if you come from this very rigid um, Christian upbringing and stay in that, you just see that as God being God, but, mm. and that God can do whatever God wants to do. And that, and we hear those things like God is sovereign. God can do what God wants to do. Don't right. have nothing to do with you. It is what it is. But then you're like, wait a minute. Like here is <laughs> the truth is that if God loves us as God does, God hears us when we say we're pained by something. God hears us when we say, this don't feel good. And I don't know why, why it had to happen. And because it hurts, because I'm confused, because I'm disappointed, because I'm disillusioned, I need you to take some extra steps to help ease some of this calm and help ease, I mean, help ease some of this chaos and help ease some of this disillusion that's a relationship, right? And even in the space of a relationship, God can hold me accountable to myself, right? That like I tell people all the time <laughs> that, you know, um scripture says God neither slumbers nor sleeps. But there are times that I know I have done the most and God has been like, I need a nap. That girl down there <laughs> has taken me through and I just I'm like I am convinced that when the sun sets really quickly in those days, it's like, oh, it got dark really fast. That was God <laughs> like, I got to I gotta get 10. Because that girl down there, like, I got to get 10. <laughs> and then um, there are days where I wake up and I'm like, okay, so God, I was at a 12 yesterday. Like, help me say it like a five <laughs> or a six today so that I yeah. can, like, even it out and balance it out. Right? But, like, the beauty then becomes that in the space of our relationship, God can also hold me accountable to the ways that my mouth was a little too snippy. And that like, I immediately, when I say something, there's a knowing and a spirit that says, "Mm -mm." like, you gotta, you gotta apologize for that. You was wrong. Right. And like, that's what happens in relationship. Like that's the beauty of relationship. And what I hope, people get from relative theology is the journey to that kind of relationship that is so abundant and so profoundly life-giving that it doesn't do anything other than make you want to be in that kind of relationship. Like, 
I I tell people all the time, these are, and my mama used to say it like this, like she would, something would happen and she would say, who would want to serve a God like this? I yeah. say it very differently. I wouldn't want to be with anybody else. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to journey with anybody else other than God because of the ways that God cares for, makes room for, holds me accountable, lifts me, and gives me room to be myself and allows me the room to let God be God. And so, like, I'm like, all right, I actually can't do this. <laughs> like, this is you. <laughs> I'm going to take my hands off because every other time I have put, I have put my hands to it. I have made a mess and I know God is like, finally, thank you. Like (laughs) now I can do what I need to do, but that's the beauty of relationship. The beauty of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I think that's a perfect uh, example is like, in any kind of uh, loving relationship that you're in, you know, between another human being, you know, mm-hmm. they always say uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, does that person make you better? Does that person bring out the best version of you? You know, yep. and, and sometimes it means holding you accountable and calling you on your bullshit, you know, exactly. like, exactly. Cause otherwise if you're just surrounded by people who are just like telling you what you want to hear, that's not a relationship. That's a, that's an enabler. That's an enabler. And that's the truth is like, Listen, ego, ego is ego. I love for people to tell me I'm great. I don't think anybody, (laughs) like, I think we love hearing that, right? Sure. But I need some people to be like, okay, girl. (laughs) Now, you know, like, I tell people all the time, I, (laughs) it was so funny. I tell this story about the ways that my grandmother helps to keep me grounded. So one day uh, I went viral a few years ago for giving my neighbor, my neighbor threw a party in the middle of the night and I gave my neighbor um, a pound cake and was like, hey, can you please be quiet? Because when I live alone and two, like when you are a single woman living alone, you got to make certain negotiations for your own safety. Um, it just so happened that when we talked, I found out that... Um, his daughter had died that March and this was his first holiday without her. And he just wanted to be around his people. My mother had been gone. I want to say about three or four years at that point. And we just talked about, and my mom had died right before Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday. And so Mm. we had a conversation about how difficult, you know, the holidays were. And I remember (laughs) I was, Everywhere, like there, it the story went viral. I had just done, I had done international news. I had just come off this like wow. Australian news channel, and all these people were telling me how wonderful and amazing I was. And I was at my grandmother's house for Christmas, and I was like, "Grandma, I just did Australian news." She's like, "That's wonderful. Can you please take that trash out because <laughs> the garbage man comes in the morning and I don't want him to miss it." And like, I, I'm sitting there like. <laughs> Thank you for grounding me, Grandma. Yeah, like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. You know, um, and that's what a good relationship does when 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 spaces hold you accountable and say, look, like you're moving differently, you know. Um, friendships do that, God does that. We should do that for other people. But that's when when you really get in those kind of spaces, that's really when you can thrive. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So let's get into kind of the meat of the book here. So Red Lip okay. Theology. I, first of all, I love the way that you kind of structure the chapters. I thought that was really creative. Thank um, you. So tell people a little bit about what, first of all, what was the inspiration behind this? Because there's a lot of, I think, really needed content in here. So kind of give people like the the gist of like what this is all about. Yeah, so Red Lip Theology really is um, about... Um, at its core, how I understand myself in the world as a black millennial woman of faith. Um, it's, it was born out of two moments. One where I was reeling from the kind of disillusion of a relationship and the ending of it. And I had really let myself go. And my best friend came to visit me and she was like, you, 
she came to lay eyes on me and she's like, you don't look like my best friend. Like you have, like, you gotta, you gotta learn how to piece, you gotta piece yourself together. And I had to be honest with her until I didn't know how, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the beauty. I think that's the beauty of good friendships when they can say like in that space, like, Hey, you're not looking like you, you're not acting like you, what's going on. And you get to say, well, I'm, well, I'm glad you recognize that. Cause I'm not me right now. Right. Um, and so I was keeping this promise to her that I would make my face every day and that I would actually, you know, put effort and energy into what I looked like. Cause I had these run over like mooty tootsie shoes that she made me throw away before she flew out. <laughs> and she was like, what are you like? I need you to look like you're 30. Like, please look like you're 30. <laughs> and, um, at the same time that I was, honoring this promise to my to my best friend I was also in seminary at Duke Divinity School immersed in theological education and that immersion really was kind of the catalyst for how I really began to think of what it means for me to really have to help women black women in particular have different kinds of faith conversations and so structuring it the way that I did which follows each chapter and each essay follows follows a particular beauty regimen right we go from skincare all the way to setting powder setting spray was that I really was having a conversation with women that that was like we get to trust the sound of our own familiar when it comes to faith, when it comes to God. And it was a conversation that didn't center cishet men. Like, I can't tell you how many, how many men have been in my DMs and they're like, what is contour? Like what, like what is highlighter? (laughs) What are you even talking to? And I'm like, good, good thing. I'm not really talking to you. So, So the beauty here is that you don't know what I'm talking about, which further proves that, this actually, this this demonic device that I use, creative device I use, actually worked. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but but ultimately, it's about what does it mean for us to for us to honor that a life lived is filled with a lot of things. Um, it's filled with deep joy and sisterhood and happiness and love is also filled with sadness and poor (laughs) decision-making and, and a, um, and disillusionment and confusion. But the beauty remains that we in this full life that we live, that it's still beautiful and it's still one that God honors. Um, and it's still one that God journeys with us in God journeys with us in and I think that that is as I hope for everyone that reads it is what I hope that they get is that God journeys with us absolutely and this book is deeply personal it's it's about a Mm -hmm. lot of experiences that you've gone through and one of the most important I think um hardest hitting moments is the beginning of the book where you talk about and we've talked about the concept of shame and, mm-hmm. and how kind of, um, it, we know the Western, uh, kind of, uh, flavor of, of Christianity, uh, cl- more closely, most closely, because that's what most of us who grew up in, grew up in. That's our kind of tradition. And, and so, you know, we've talked before about the role of shame and kind of mm-hmm. that, that version of Christianity. Uh, but it's, it's, much more multi-layered uh, when you talk about it in the beginning of the book, because you talk about it from the perspective of you're a black woman living, growing up in the South, mm-hmm. uh, raised by a single mother. And so there's a whole nother, there's Ooh. more layers of the onion there for you. So mm-hmm. talk about just how shame was so prevalent in kind of the teachings and ingrained in the version of Christianity that you were hearing growing up. Yeah. So I, it really is rooted in the fact that my mom refused. Uh, my mother was um, not married to my father. And as was the custom at that time, and still is in certain in certain uh, church circles, is that when you are not married, the woman is to stand in front of the congregation and repent publicly for um, being pregnant. 
uh, rarely, if ever, um, is the father supposed to stand there with her. In this wow. instance, my daddy didn't, and they met in church. Like that was the they met there in the choir. He was there, um, and my mom refused to do that um, because she felt as though to a uh, to publicly repent in front of people whose who sins, quote unquote, she never, she didn't know. Um, you know, one was not how she understood the, the expression of communal accountability, <laughs> right. but, but more than that, she says she just didn't want to, she didn't want to raise a child um, in the context of believing that what brought that child in the world was sin and, and that she was a mistake that needed to be apologized for. She just was not going to do that. And so while my mom made a very brave step in refusing to do that, I grew up still in a community that really blamed single mothers for its downfall Mm -hmm. and really blamed single mothers for um, those conditions that did not necessarily falter goodness and life. And that was hard and that was painful because I also heard those sermons in church. And um, I tell pastors all the time, like, and I say this in the book, I don't think that they understood that when they preached that way, what I was hearing is if my mom had just loved and obeyed God more, I would not be here. Um, Because it's not like if my mama would have waited or realized that my daddy was going to be who he was and moved on to somebody else, that she would have gotten married and had me like, No, like I am me because I come from them in the circumstances in which I did. And all I heard was I wouldn't be here if my mama loved God. And so on some level, Mm -hmm. you know, my mama loved loved me more than God is what they were saying. And there's some there's some beauty in that in certain instances. But then there's there that is not the conversation to even be having. Um, and so I grew up with a lot of guilt that was not mine to carry. I grew up um, with a lot of sadness and and believing one that um, my mother's station in the world as a as a single mom was my fault. Um, believing that how could I have a healthy relationship or how could anybody see me as valuable if my daddy didn't Um, really reeling from the, the fact that that was and is quite possibly the most significant relationship with a man in my life. And he didn't want me. Right. And so Mm -hmm. And, and having to make sense of all of that stuff with God at the center, um, going to church every Sunday, going, hearing the sermons, going through the motions, feeling deeply broken and sad behind it and not, um, mm, mm, and you know, and not, and not trying to, I would say, make sense of um make sense of all of it as a kid and not necessarily needing to you know make sense of that in in that way like that was that was hard you know um that was really 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 hard for me um and i hope you know that people with the book realizes I hope they see that the world that we live in gets constructed very quickly (laughs) based (laughs) off of how you think you are interpreting it for God 
Mm. Um, and that becomes the danger, right? Is that like you interpret it for God in ways that are not loving, you know, like I, I've had to say to pastors, like, what is it to like, what is it to be exclusive in this way? And then turn around and tell me how big God's heart is. Right. Like, you know, like the world gets constructed in ways that are so hurtful um, that it will take, and I've said in my life, um, it'll take a while um, to, I think for a lot of us, um, to to deal with the pain of, and unlearn some of the things that, that the church has done to us. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people listening right now can identify with, with that, like growing up with, uh, more often than not, probably well-intentioned people who were, Mm -hmm. uh, who were just doing, just, you know, creating damage and creating lasting damage, uh, maybe unbeknownst to them, but, but Mm -hmm. things that, we're all having to unpack years later. Mm-hmm. So talk a little bit about, because you, one of the things that I love uh, you talk about in the book is, is just how important things like therapy are. And so yeah. talk about as you get getting older and, and you mentioned that like you're going through this as a child and, and through the, the lens of a child and, and probably not fully comprehending what all of these things mean that you're kind of just kind of absorbing mm-hmm. as you get a little older and you can kind of, start to come to grips with what uh, some of the things that you've heard in church and been taught. Um, how did you start to unpack that? How did you start to deal with that and heal from, from that stuff? So I will say this, um, therapy in this, in any context was easy for me because, um, my mother was a mental health nurse practitioner. And so my mom would say things like you need God and every other qualified professional to be your best self. Um, and in that, um, I, (laughs) I'm laughing because, so as my mom also, she like, um, she saw patients and one of the things that, you know, um, pharmaceutical companies would uh, give things right to to practitioners because they want you to use you know their their medications. Mm-hmm. So on one level, mental health was normalized for me in that way because my of the work that my mother did. But on another level, mental health was normalized for me because my mama would be like, "I'm not buying you a notebook because Zola." just gave me notebooks like go take one of those to school and so like kids had like trapper keepers and like the mead five-star notebooks i had yep. like a well butrin folder i had like <laughs> zoloft and prozac ink pens because mom was like i'm not buying this like they just dropped off 60 well butrin notebooks like you're gonna take one of those to school like you're you're advertising for her <laughs> you know and i'm like i'm like in i'm in class like putting my hand over the logo so that it, nobody <laughs> knew that that was what i had and so i i grew up i grew up in in a context where i saw a mom who was deeply faithful mm. um also do the work to ensure that people were well and thrived. And that mattered to me um, because I also grew up in a context that wanted to tell people that you had to pick or choose, right? Like you couldn't be depressed and Christian, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't take medication and be a person of faith. And I didn't see that. Um, there are people who still believe that. And I think it matters to uh, I, I, it matters to the church for those of us who can have healthier, nuanced conversations to say, hey, no, like this isn't this isn't what this isn't what this looks like. Like this is that it matters to to talk about the the fragility of the human experience 
right? Um, yeah. Because God has not called us to be anything other than human. And the truth is, is that there are some experiences that are weighty in the ways that they that they can cause us to experience certain levels of pain. And then there's also the truth that there are some things that happen to us or some things that we experience that are, and when it comes to mental health, that are the product of biology and genetics and and that have nothing to do with anything that we have done. And if and and we are even in those moments still good because we are good creation. And so I I think that where the work remains for me and for others is how do we continue to foster conversations that invite people into this knowing and this awareness with themselves that gives them room to let God be who God is, right? That like you get to you get to lean into the truth of your experience and it be holy. You get to lean into the truth of I I I I, I deal with anxiety, right? You know, you get to live you live, get to live in the truth of the of the reality that I may, you know, live with and manage a depressive condition. And yet I'm still good, right? That like that, you know, I may have a personality disorder and yet I'm still good, right? And so what does it mean for us to honor that we live in a world where people need us to be that where people need, I'll put it this way, where people need us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that way. Right. That like, that like, sis, you need, you you need to go see somebody like, you know, like, Hey homie, like you, yeah. Like we actually might need to consider, you know, that, that, that prescription, right. Like that, you know, it's okay. You know, you know, I think, I think that what, the gift for me was that those kinds of conversations were not taboo. And I think the call for me is how do I make those conversations less taboo for the people that listen to me? I love that. And and I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly what you're doing is just simply by talking about it and normalizing it, it starts to remove some of that stigma and some of that taboo, uh, from, from it. And I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think, uh, especially as a, as a male, you know, there's mm-hmm. this ridiculous stigma that comes along with being a man and, and looking at it like it's some sort of weakness to be, mm-hmm. you know, to be depressed or sad. Oh, just suck it up and get over it. And we've talked right. about that a lot on this podcast, how that needs to stop, man. That is yeah. just not healthy and it's not helpful. And, um, yeah. whether you're a man or a woman, you know, we just, we need to talk about it more and, and admit that, like you said, part of being a human is all of the mm-hmm. broken pieces that you come with. And it's just yeah. part of being human. And like you said, it doesn't make you l- less good. Yeah. It just makes you human. Being human right. is hard, man. <laughs> Look, it's hard. It is. You know, it is. It is this, um, like, I don't know why we abandon emotions or that we demonize. It. And here's the thing. This is why I tell people, you know, I, um, this is where Paul and I, um, you know, I don't necessarily rock with him in these instances, <laughs> but there were so many times where the, the discussion of, um, the flesh, right. Mm. Mm-hmm. gets demonized where like, you know, Paul says one of the things like in this flesh dwells no good thing. Um, that <laughs> might what? be how you see yourself. <laughs> Cause you was out here killing Christians and whatnot, but like, that's not how I see me. Right. That yeah. this, that in this flesh, this actual flesh is how God called me to show up in the world. And in this flesh actually does dwell a good thing. Right. Mm. Um, now, how do I steward it? How do I take how do I take responsibility 
for the ways that I may mismanage my emotions, right? Um, the ways that I may not be the best steward over my body, over this flesh as it relates to my physical health. Like those are conversations. But the but the overall inherent ways that we've often been called and told to dismiss faith. I mean, not dismiss faith, but dismiss our emotions and our feelings really ground how we see faith. It really grounds how we push and, and, and view those who, who we're supposed to be in community with, especially when they have a, a difficult moment, right? Because Mm. you have, you have a scripture that says in this flesh dwells no good thing. But then you also have in the same book, the strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, right? Like that means <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that there are some times when that weakness is as it relates to how we manage our emotions, what's happening with us mentally, what's happening with us emotionally, what's happening with us spiritually. And we deserve to be in community with people who can say, as you're working to be well, as you're working to, to, to get what you need, let, let me, let me be here and let me help you. That's a completely different conversation than why, why aren't you praying more? You're not depressed. You just, you just lack faith. Turn your plate down and turn your face to the wall. Uh, no, like actually there's a chemical imbalance and I actually need to eat. <laughs> like that, like that's <laughs> right. not going to help you. <laughs> like yeah. I actually need to take food with this medicine. So yeah. maybe giving me those directives are not what I need right now, but I need somebody who can usher me into a very different, a very different place of wholeness and wellness. Yeah, I, I I identify with that <laughs> on a on a deep level. I mean, if you want to pray for somebody, pray for my my therapist to you know d- discern like what's going on with me so that I can get the proper treatment that I need to be the most whole version of myself. And like for some people, you know, like you, you like you mentioned, some people their bodies just don't produce enough serotonin, for example, mm-hmm. and right. And that's not your fault. That's not anyone else's fault. That's just the way it is. And and some people, just in the same way that some people's body doesn't produce enough insulin. But thank God that there are science and there are doctors out there and professionals and therapists who can who can help uh, help uh, help with those things. You know, help provide medications that that supplement some of the things that your body lacks and. I'm, you know, I'm thankful every day. I, I deal with depression and I probably will the rest of my life. Uh, and, you know, and I'm one who my body just doesn't produce enough serotonin or dopamine or whatever. Um, so thank God for people like your mother yeah. and, you know, and, and, um, well, Um, yeah. Listen, <laughs> listen, like I, like I, you know, I, it's, you know, John, like I, I really think too, you know, I was just I was just talking to the folks over at the church needs therapy, and I'm really excited about the kinds of conversations that we're having. But um, but I also like I wonder, you know, what what it's gonna look like for us to even like what it look what shoot what it now I'm sitting here with you thinking like what would it look like to partner with Will Butrin? And and have faith conversations and dialogues that say, hey, like, because these are serious. Like, I, I literally, um, and I'm, and this conversation is going in a whole different direction. Um, <laughs> so if my publishers get mad, you tell them it was my fault. But um, we'll circle back around. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I'll just be like, I'll take that ill. But like, I, I, I really was sitting with like, I have a friend who um, has debilitating levels of anxiety. And um, he said, he, his doctors have, have said to him, um, if, you, if, if we can get you on medicine, but I'm, I am, we are 100% sure that you will see a difference in your mood and in the ways that you move, 
And he, his pastor told him that is not how we fight the enemy. That, wow. that this is, that this is about, that this is about the testing of your faith and, and use all of these scriptures. And I am watching my friend deteriorate. Ugh. And, and it's heightening because we're in a global pandemic. Right. And, and, and the thing that people don't recognize about anxiety is that when it is, and I'm somebody who, who, who navigates high levels of anxiety that like, it doesn't just show up in one area of your life. Right. That like social anxiety gets exacerbated by when, especially when you're having issues around health and health anxiety. And like, I had the fly the other day and had to have a conversation with a friend before I got on the flight. And they were like, you are okay. You are fine. You will be well breathe. And like, like, and so I'm watching my friend deteriorate because he's received a message that says that in order to honor God, he has to prove through means that nobody (laughs) should ever have to use that he has to prove his faithfulness to God by not getting the very things that he needs. And yes, scripture talks about, you know, God calling apostles and bishops and teachers. God also called doctors and scientists and, you know, like, and, and, and people who, who are committed to the totality of our wellness. And I think that we have to push for greater conversations that, that are not conversations of, of um, fire and brimstone, but they are conversations that say, look, life is hard. We are, and, and life was already hard before we before 2020 came and we all were li- realized we were living life in an episode of contagion or black mirror like right. no like nobody thought that we would be here you know like black mirror and groundhog's day kind of combined <laughs> you know, like it's just like and the fact that 2022 has really come in and it feels like 2020.2, like yeah. it, it, it has just, it's like nobody expected this. And yet, what does it mean for us to honor that there's some things that we need to do for our wellness? Amen. And Elise, if you're listening, I'm sorry, I pulled her off track. <laughs> I will, I will now pull us back on track. (laughs) She's a sweetheart. Um, So we can, uh, to stay on the same kind of topic that we kind of started on and, and to kind of veer us back into the book, book uh, realm here. um, One of the things I thought was really fascinating that you talk about in the book in regards to, again, going back to healing from, you know, some of the traumas that you Mm -hmm. suffered kind of growing up was the way in which we look at God and kind of this notion that God is this like, old white man, uh, first of all, you know, God having a gender. Second of all, God having a race is also, to me, kind of similarly ridiculous, you know? Yes. But yes. like, what changed in, in kind of when you started to see God as someone that you could more identify with, how that sort of changed the way in which you viewed the world? I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, so part of, part of my, a lot of my angst around God being a man, and I talk about it in the essay of suing God for back child support, um, (laughs) is, is, um, is grounded in the, in my relationship with my father. Right. And that like, I was using all of these, you know, he and God is a father and all these things. I'm just like, well, mine is trifling and it looks like he's over there flourishing. So obviously God and my daddy are homeboys and I got a problem with that. And I, 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 that was a very juvenile way that I was working to articulate something that was of a much more deeper issue and concern for me. And that was what it means for us to think through what it means to gender God. And, 
And I'll be honest, John, like part of it was that I needed to restore some of the majesty and holiness in God to me. And using pronouns that I use for everybody else didn't do that. Like, God is God. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And like, there was something very majestic and sacred about moving away from conversations of the common Mm. um, that, that I needed. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think, and I talk about it in the book, I think if we all, if people were to ask us how, how we describe God, I think we would all have these very different, um, explanations or descriptions, but they would all pair back down to a person who has loved us from an amazingly deep well, whether it's our parents, whether it's a grandparent, whether it was a teacher. Um, And I believe that even this regal, majestic, sacred God is to be that personal to us, right? That like, Mm. that it is that, it is the way that God literally wraps God's self in flesh and dwells among us because God is to be that personal. And if we don't make room for that kind of God, then the danger becomes how then do we have a faith that speaks to us personally? And I think that, I think that that's where we are right now is that you got all of these, like, whether it's right wing, whether it's left wing, uh, my grandma would say east wing, north wing, (laughs) south wing, like all of these factions that want to tell us like who God is, right? Like, but they can tell us who God is supposed to be for everybody else, right? Right. (laughs) Like, and they forget, like one of my, I've been sitting with it all year. But it's that passage where Jesus is like, Jesus is with the disciples. And Jesus is like, who who do men say I am? Like, what 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 they saying about me in the streets? Like, what they what they saying? And all of the disciples, oh, they saying you this, they saying you that, they said that you, you know, da da da. And so Jesus is like, okay. And then Jesus is like, so who do you say I am? Don't nobody say nothing but Peter. Like they had so much to say about what everybody else was saying. But then when it came to who, who, okay, so what do you, who do you think I am? That was a theological question because the theological is personal and the personal is theological. And the only person who could say something was Peter. He was like, "You're, you're the Christ. Like, I have seen you do these things and I know that you can do them for me. I know that you are who you say you are, right? Like that wasn't about who, who Peter knew him to be for everybody else. It was about who Peter knew him to be for himself, right? That like, if you can't have a conversation or a relationship with God where God can't look at you and be like, all right, now shut the door so we can talk. Like, and, and that truth be there, then what are we talking about? Right? Like, and I am part of, part of, of ungendering God for me was about what does it look like for me to be, what does it look like for my relationship with God to be as authentic and as holy and as real and as true and as transformative as possible? And part of that was I want names for and descriptions of God that are not common. Right? Like when you when you look at when you look at scripture, 
Hagar literally names the place where she ran and met God as this because he the God is the God who sees because God saw me right like everybody names stuff like you know that because of this personal encounter and they wanted something to honor how holy and sacred that is because that in our, that encounter and interaction changed their life. And that was the same for me. I think that's the same for all of us. And I think, lastly, language is limiting. Like, language is at its best. We are always groaning towards better language, groping towards better language. Language, and I I say that as somebody who works with words every day, language limits us. As vast, and I don't know every word in the world, and I still know that those words are not enough, right? Um, And so, what does it mean for us to honor that even at our best, as we were trying to describe God, that it still is not sufficient? That's with all of us, pronouns or not. Like, I can give you a description of God for me, and it still isn't enough. It still isn't enough because of who God is. And I think that that's an important and a very important note and and moment to to honor and lift. Uh, I love that. It reminds me of uh, one of my favorite just theological thinkers in general is this this rabbi uh, named Art Green who taught, who has this um, little sermon that he did that, that uh, I found online and uh, he talks about the name of God and and translating it from the Hebrew and um, the the it's the the verse that we typically translate to I I am who I am or you know and uh, he he said another translation that they often uh, use is is was will be as if God's like saying you know you can't pin me down I, you know I can flip from a an adjective to a to a noun and and back again and and uh, you know I. I God is a mystery. God is a mystery. Mm-hmm. And I, I prefer to worship a God who is a mystery, uh, who, who's beyond yeah. anything I can imagine, you know, versus one that I can put in a box. Cause that seems that's yeah. immediately puts limitations on God and what God can do. Yeah, man. Yeah. <clears throat> I love it. <laughs> so this I know we're running. Cool. Yeah, this is good stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is rich. So, uh, Last thing I wanted to uh, to, to to end on, I think, um, from the book is where you talk about, um, and there's a bunch of different directions because your your uh, section on sex and and kind of our <laughs> the shameful <laughs> way that we look at it, I think, is really good too. But um, but I also think that it's important to talk about where you discuss womanist theology and how that had an impact on your own personal mental health. And so, what it, first of all, explain to people what womanist theology is and then how how it was uh an aid to you sure so womanist theology is a theological discourse um that explores um black women's relationship with god and um how how that impacts not only their view of the world but their the world around them um and i i have before I before I was formally introduced to womanist theology, as I talk about in the book, I was informally introduced to it because my mother was reading books by Iyanla e. Van Zandt, and my mama was reading uh, Renita Weems, and she was um, reading Susan L. Taylor in essence. And these these moments that she was hearkening back to that were um, that really were about solidifying her as this profound um, Black woman who who could and would be grounded in faith and, um, and could and would be able to raise this daughter on her own. Um, they were, they were, those voices were pivotal for her in that that like, that she wasn't, that she could do this. Right. And so even before I knew what womanist theology was, I was raised, as I talk about in the book, in a womanist home, like my mama was a womanist. Um, 
when I got to school and when I got to study it more, um, I also saw where the work, the, it gave me the language to articulate Black women's relationship with God. And in giving me that language, I was able to explore um, even more language on my own to, mm. to, to also honor that womanist theology goes far and it can go farther for for black millennial women like myself. And it was like, what is if it's limiting for me and I have a theological education, I have a master's in sociology, then what how is how is it working for sisters who don't have that same level of access? And so um while Relic theology is a womanist endeavor and it's a womanist text. It stands on the shoulders of so many and works to advance the conversation even more. Uh, And I'm just, I'm grateful for one, um, the work of so many black women to, to say that black women have a right to speak to and honor the work that they have done with God. Um, They have a right to name that relationship for themselves. And I'm just grateful that real theology stands in that tradition. Like that's a blessing to me. Um, I wanted to be a writer because of what I saw, because of what I saw um, Renita Wings and Iyanla Van Zandt's books do for my mama. Um, she would, she was reading essence every month and she was cutting out Renita Williams's articles and Susan L. Taylor's letter to the editor. And she was folding it up and had them, having them in her purse and having them in her, um, in her Bible. And I wanted that kind of impact on the women that I care about. And so here I am, you know, now, hearing that. And so it's a real full circle moment. And I'm really grateful that, um, that relative theology gets to sit in that tradition. Well, I, I think that, um, your mama sounds like an absolutely incredible, uh, woman. And, uh, I think you do an absolutely fantastic job of honoring her in this book. And I know that, uh, she would certainly be proud of you, uh, for, for this accomplishment. So, um, and she's even got a little spot in the back of the book too, which I thought was really she cool. Does. Yeah. She you does. honor her well. Thank yeah. you. Oh, that means so much to me. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, any, any last, uh, any last thoughts you want to leave people with? What is your hope for, for this book? Um, now that it's out there in the world. I hope that people can hear it and, um, and read it and, and know that it's possible to have a life of, um, to journey in a way that lends itself to the beauty of, um, what life can be. Um, when you, when you trust the sound of your own familiar and, and I hope that we can all find ways to lean into who God is for us, um, and, and allow that to transform who we can be for ourselves and who we can be for other people. And so, Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Thank you for everyone who's read the book and supported it. Thank you for those who will go and get the book and support it. It means, it means so much. And I mean that. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I I really appreciate it. This is such a fun conversation before I let you go though. uh, People should definitely go, go out and get it. It's red lip theology. Uh, Go get it anywhere books are sold, but where can people go to keep up on top of your work and what you're up to? So you can follow me on the socials at Candice Benbow. So that's C-A-N-D-I-C-E-B-E-N-B-O-W. And then you can follow me I mean, on my website at uh, CandiceBenbow.com. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. This is so fun. Yeah, come back yes, anytime. <laughs> I would love to. Have a great one. Thank you. John was young and driven with a heart of gold Finished seminary, married, found a church he could call home 
Made a living, giving, dying folks a shoulder and a hand Until he told his leaders that he had some feelings for another man And they said, John, you must go Take your broken heart and walk it to the door We know you're hurting And you've been giving But now you're damaged goods And you gotta give some more John, we love you But we can't go Jen could sing a song and channel the divine Spend a decade chair I've seen 